Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. It's good to be able to join you again for this period of Bible study. You know, in Matthew chapter 22, we find the Pharisees asking Jesus a great question. The question was, what is the greatest command of all? There was a lot of commands, about 16, I mean, rather 613 commands in the Old Testament. And the Jews often tried to summarize these commands into just a few simple ones. And so this, these scribes and the Pharisees, they were testing Jesus, asking him, which of all those is the greatest one? Jesus answered in verse 37 of Matthew 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here Jesus completely answered their questions. He said, love is the greatest command of all. Because with love, you will do all the other things and you will never break those other laws if you really loved one another. We hear a lot about love in the modern world. But the problem is that many times we do not understand what that love really means. For instance, many people love the wrong things. Some people love themselves. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 in verse 2, For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and so forth. Yet many people love themselves. He also mentioned in 2 Timothy 3 in verse 4 that people would love pleasure rather than be lovers of God. And so many people today, they're interested only in the pleasure they can gain out of life. And, of course, other people love money. First Timothy 6, in verse 10, Paul said, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And certainly in our modern world, many people love the money that we have. And some people simply love the world. That means that they love the things in the world, the pleasures and everything. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 and 17, for instance, there John wrote that, that men would love the world, and if you love the world, you cannot be lovers of God. That's why he said in verse 15, beginning, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Here John said, do not love the world, because if you love the world, then you cannot love God at the same time. And some people love the praise of men. Again, in John chapter 12 and verse 43, regarding some of the Pharisees, it said, for they love the praise of men, rather than the praise of God. And some very similar to this, they love their preeminence. They love to have the best places. For instance, Jesus said in Matthew 23 and verse 6, they love the best places at feast and the best seats in the synagogues. This is very similar to wanting the praise of men. You know, what? they'll do whatever they can to gain the praise and the honor of men. And to them, that is much more important than the loving God and doing God's will. We need to be very careful that we do not love the wrong things. And we also then need to be careful that we understand what love is. Many people, as I said before, in our modern world, do not have a good understanding of what love is. For instance, some people think that love nullifies obedience. In other words, as long as you say as you love, then you can do whatever you want pretty much as long as love is there. For instance, many people now are guilty of fornication, but they are justified by saying, we love each other. 
Or they might say, doesn't God want us to be happy? And this makes us happy. You see, in their mind, the idea of love kind of rules out the breaking of certain commandments. We have all kinds of sexual misconduct justified in the name of love. Things such as homosexuality and other things like that. Again, all of those is justified as long as love is there. So to those people, you see, love nullifies those other commandments. Love nullifies obedience. Another very similar idea to this is the idea that we do not really have to be too concerned about specific commandments of God as long as we love God. For instance, uh, instrumental music, baptism, other things of worship, and all those commandments, all those doesn't really matter too much, just as long as love is there. As long as you love God, then that's all that really matters. You see, they don't understand what love is. Other people think that love will do away with punishment or chastisement. In other words, some people look upon the God of the Old Testament as a completely different God from the one in the New Testament. Because they would say the God of the Old Testament is one of judgment and wrath. But the God of the New Testament, he's a God of love. In other words, to those people, love and rebuking and judgment do not go together. You cannot love and judge people at the same time. Often the rebuking of sin and false doctrine is called a lack of love. In other words, if we as Christians rebuke sin in the world, then we're often called to be unloving. The reason why we're rebuking sin is simply because we do not love as we should. If we really loved everybody, then we would not rebuke sin at all. Well, that's not what love is. The rebuking of sin can be love, and it is love. You see, a lack of love might be exhibited in rebuking sin, but rebuking sin in and of itself does not mean that love is missing. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 20, Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. There we have a command from Paul to rebuke sin publicly. And certainly, I don't think we want to say that Paul lacked love, but there we find a positive command to rebuke sin, even in a public manner. You see, true love brings correction. Some parents do not discipline their children, and they may falsely say, well, we cannot discipline our children because we must love them too so much. Uh, that's not love. You don't love them too much, the reason why you dis don't discipline your children. You really don't love your children enough if you fail to discipline. The wise man said, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Yet we need to discipline our children. If we really love our children, then we will do that. Hebrews 12 verse 6, the writer of Hebrews said, regarding God, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You see, if God loves you, then God at times will chasten us as we need it. So those are some things that the Bible love is not. So now let's look for a moment at what love really is. Well, first of all, when Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, obviously that means being willing to obey God's commandments. You see, true love is action. True love is obedience. Christ said, or rather John wrote in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, verse 14, you have basically the same statement. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Again, love and obedience go together. So if we're going to love God, then that means you must do and obey his commandments. If you do not obey your commandments, then that simply means you do not really love God. 
But then love is also must be manifested towards our brethren. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, there Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also may love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. That's a sign or a, a sign of our discipleship. That's a sign of being true disciples of God is our love towards one another. So if you do not really love your brethren, then you cannot be a true disciple of God. But what does it mean to love one another? Well, obviously it means much more than just say you do. It's easy to say you love one another, but it's another thing to actually do it. John, in 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, or 17 and 18, he mentions some things about how we know we love one another. There John says, verse, 1 John 3, 17 and 18, For whoever has this world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So how do you know if you really love your fellow man? Well, John gives us a very practical test here. He said, you love your fellow man if you're willing to help them when they're in need. If they need something and you have what they need, then you must be willing to give it to them. That's what it means to love. If you're not willing to do that, then you don't really love your brethren. And of course, love towards our brethren, our fellow Christian, is one thing, but loving our neighbor is something else. Again, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 39, Jesus said we must love our neighbor. He even told a parable of the uh, rich man and, uh, excuse me, rich man and Lazarus, not the rich man, Lazarus, excuse me. He told a parable of the man who, was uh, beaten on the road and good Samaritan come by and helped him. And then, of course, that's what it means to love your neighbor. Love means you do good to someone who needs you. Paul wrote in Romans 13 in verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love means you're going to be willing to help them, certainly not harm them. And then finally, we must be willing to even to love our enemies. Christ again said, Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Love your enemies. Oh, that is so difficult, isn't it? What does it mean to love your enemies? It's more than just not hurting them. As Jesus said here, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Do good to even to your enemies. Those who hurt you and try to persecute you, pray for them. That's what it means to love your enemies. You see, that's what Bible love is. You love God by doing his commandments. Then you love your fellow man, your fellow Christian, by helping them if they have a need. And you're willing even to love your enemies. Do good to those, even to those who hate you. Yes, love is a universal commandment. But you know, love is a language that everyone can speak. In our world, we are divided in so many different ways, languages and so many other things. But love transcends every barrier. If we we'll truly love our fellow man the way the Bible tells us to love one another, then that will solve so many problems that we have in the world. And remember, you cannot really be a disciple of Christ unless you do love. Love God and love your brethren. That's why Jesus said the greatest command of all is to love God. And the second one is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. May this encourage each one of us to always love in the true sense of the word. Thank you.
It is God's will that you must be saved. First listen to the Bible truth and you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15, Arsradi Madurai, 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420. 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you